it really never ceases to amaze me how unwilling media outlets and their employees of major corporations who work in New York and Washington and whose lives are very incestuous, they just all constantly speak to each other and for each other, all these media and political people in D.C. and New York who are all part of the same ecosystem, all part of the same homogenized view. They just talk to each other and for one another and to one another. They just talk about January 6th forever. They talked about Russiagate forever. And meanwhile, none of the country cares because the rest of the country lives completely different lives than the people and media who purport to speak on their behalf. We've seen it over and over. And if 2016 didn't show them that, when they were so sure that Hillary Clinton was by far in a different universe of superiority than Donald Trump, only for so many people in the country to go and vote for Donald Trump and make him the president, despite all the Russiagate stuff and all the other stuff that was said during the campaign. In fact, I remember in 2015, Trump started really leading in the polls against people like Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio, and people were kind of shocked. But there was this assumption, oh, he's just a new thing. We've seen this before in the Republican Party. People like Michelle Bachman or Alan Keyes or uh, Ben, ben uh, Carson or a bunch of different people have shot to the top of the polls for a little while. Republicans are still kind of interested in these new things and then they fall back and then Mitt Romney or John McCain win. And the Washington press court were sure that was going to happen with Donald Trump. And I remember in 2015, that was when Trump made that comment about John McCain because John McCain had been critical of Trump when McCain said, when, when Donald Trump said, look, I don't really respect John McCain that much because he was a member of the military who got caught. His plane crash got caught. I respect members of the military who don't get caught, captured. And I remember the dean of the Washington press corps, this like old, you know, wise man who's been around Washington forever, been analyzing politics for the Washington Post forever. His name is Dan Baltz. He's like this old, thin, white guy with like a gray beard, exactly what you would expect if you don't know what he looks like. He went and wrote an article in which he said, this is the end of Trump. It was one thing when he was kind of entertaining, but Americans are so going to be so outraged that he would attack a national hero like John McCain in this way that he's going to now collapse. And they quoted all these Republican operatives saying, this is it, this is over. Because the press corps was in love with John McCain and they were so deeply offended, but no one in the country cared no one, why would anyone in the country struggling to earn a living or to send their kids to school or to get health care care about these internecine conflicts between people who have been around in Washington forever? That's what Washington reporters care about. That's not what Americans care about at all. It didn't affect Trump in the slightest. It continued to just skyrocket and then obviously won the nomination and the election despite all kinds of things far more severe than that. And how they didn't look at everything that they said and did and realize, wow, wait a minute, what we think matters, what we think should matter is totally different than what pretty much the rest of the country thinks because maybe our lives are so different. Now, you see this every time these journalists go and, you know, usually they're just speaking to like pundits and operatives. They put, invite them on their show, put them in the green room. But every time they go and speak to like the ordinary folk to try and like, oh, I'm curious. You tell me what you think. I want to learn from you. Complete comedy ensues because they discover that none of the things that they spend every day waking up to talk about and focused on and being excited about has any importance whatsoever to the vast majority of the country. Alex Wagner went to Michigan. She's the person who replaced Rachel Maddow. She's the 9 o'clock host on MSNBC. And she went to talk to uh, union voters. And here's part of what happened. Evan, talk to me about your level of interest in the, the criminal charges and so forth. Uh, February 6th? Jan January 6th. January 6th. Um, so I remember that So day. just that alone, just imagine that. You have spent years saying that January 6th is like the most important date in American history. It's like on par with 9-11 and Pearl Harbor. And she asked him about that. He's like, you mean February 6th? And she's like, January 6th. Like, he doesn't care. Why would he care about January 6th? It was almost five years ago now. It was like a three-day, a three-hour protest that turned into a riot at the Capitol that was immediately put down. Why would this person be thinking about January 6th just because it's on her mind all the time? And she was also asking about these charges that had been filed against Trump and asking how much he cares about these. And this is what happened. February 6th? Jan January 6th. January 6th. Um, so I remember that day. I know he was the standing president. Um, 
I'm not familiar with the charges that are being brought against him for that. I don't, I'm not following that charge or the, I know there's multiple court cases going on. I'm just not familiar with it. I mean, that doesn't sound like it's going to be a factor in deciding who to vote for. No. Okay. So when I, when I say January 6th, what do you think? Oh, I just remember seeing it on the news, like all the riots and stuff. Don't really know what it was about or what happened though. Did it, I mean, how did it make you feel when you saw it? Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't really feel any way about it. I don't, I mean, people showed their emotion, I guess. Probably in the wrong way, but it happened. Who here is? I, mean, just, I just want you to think about that for a second. So in her world, she works at MSNBC. In her world, the two most important things are January 6th and the charges against Trump. Like, this is the most, I remember Chris Hayes, the eight o'clock host, I'm not exaggerating, we've shown this clip before. The first time that Jack Smith indicted Donald Trump, Chris Hayes cried on air. He cried, I mean, like actual tears, like crying, his eyes were red. And he said the reason is because he feels so relieved, so relieved that the thing that he's been seeing, this criminality, is finally being validated. Imagine just how completely detached from any material struggle you have to be to cry because Donald Trump got indicted over uh, the 2020 election. I mean, just, just imagine how much everything else must be completely taken care of, what a, just an abstract world you live in, in order for you to make that your number one priority. And she spends every day of her life talking about January 6th and Trump's charges, and before that, about Russiagate. And then you go and you're like, what do you think of January 6th? What about those charges? And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I kind of heard it out on the news, but I don't know. Why are you asking me about irrelevant stuff like that? And you could see she was just like shocked and kind of smirking at the same time. Here's another clip from her little field trip. They were also particularly motivated by concerns about the economy, including inflation and the rising cost of housing. Do you think the cause, housing is an issue? Uh, yes, I actually just recently purchased a home. So yes, I do think that it is too high. It, it's just the cost of a livable move-in ready home nowadays is just absurd, I think, in my opinion, to where before I feel like you could buy a house for a reasonable price and it, not have to have a ton of work put into it. I just recently purchased a house as well. And uh, this house has gone up $50,000 in the past five years. So. I mean, just looking at the prices in the past five years, you know, why has it gone up so much? What can we do to bring it back down to what it was? We're fortunate enough, our wages have been able to keep up with inflation, but a lot of people, they haven't been so fortunate, and they have to choose between paying bills, buying food, putting food on the table, you know, so I think that's going to play a big factor in this. So if you're an MSNBC host and you're making, I don't know, $700,000 a year, whatever she's making, $500,000 a year, Something like that. Obviously, that's not the kind of thing you're thinking about. Oh, the house went up $50,000. Oh, my God. And in fact, the more polling data kept showing that people, everyone in the middle class and the working class basically was saying, yeah, we can't afford things anymore. Prices keep going up. These kind of people kept going on the air and in their columns and saying, no, these people are wrong. They have no idea what they're talking about. Actually, inflation is under control. The economy is doing really well. Just like denying their, their, their lived experience to use... Uh, really horrible term, but in this case, it actually applies. It's like these people are living their daily lives and perceiving these things, and then these people over here, these journalists, are living completely different lives. And they have no humility about that at all. They really believe that they're speaking for these people. Every poll shows this, too. Here from CBS in June of 2024, this is before Biden dropped out. Trump and Biden are neck and neck. And nationally and in battleground states, quote, almost all of the factors on voters' minds this election among all the factors on voters' mind this election, former President Donald Trump's guilty verdict pales in comparison to issues like the economy, inflation, and the border, all items on which Trump maintains advantages. As such, the verdict has not dramatically reshaped the race. I can't tell you how many times I heard a uh, journalist and pundit saying, once Donald Trump is found guilty of felonies, I mean, there's no way Americans are going to vote. No one has any recollection of that. It was like a a one day story, it was a ridiculous case brought in by a Manhattan prosecutor, very liberal, with a very liberal Manhattan jury that convicted Trump basically on bookkeeping error charges and they converted it into a felony. And no one cared except 
these journalists. Because again, when you're completely comfortable and taken care of, these are the sorts of things that you can think about. Here was a chart, major factors in vote, the top answers compared to the Trump conviction. What do you care about most? The economy, 81%. Inflation, 75%. The state of democracy, 74%. It's very unclear what that means. I think it just means if you ask people that, they don't mean like 2020 election denial because it's 74%. Then crime, the U.S.-Mexico border gun policy, and then all the way at the bottom, a measly 28%, all Democrats, I'm sure, who say they care about Trump's conviction. And if you look at the attention that these issues get inside the media, it's basically almost completely reversed. Here was a poll that asked about Trump's guilty verdict. Uh, this was among Trump supporters, but here, here was uh, the uh, Pew Research poll from September where they asked, the economy is the top issue for voters in the 2024 election. And then you can see here, it just goes down by, uh, by both parties. What is the most important issue to you? The economy, healthcare, Supreme Court appointments, foreign policy, violent crime, immigration, gun policy, abortion, racial and ethnic identity, and climate change. And if you just compare the, uh, the, the issues that voters care about to what kind of coverage they get in the media, it's almost inverse. The thing the media covers most are the things voters care about least. One of the things that made Democrats and liberals happier than almost anything I've seen make them happy in the last year was when Oprah Winfrey, the multi-billionaire who's lived a very lavish life for many decades, she earned it, she is self-made, et cetera, but nonetheless, hosted Kamala Harris, and there were all these you know, major celebrities who videoed in to endorse Kamala Harris, and the whole thing was bereft of any kind of substantive conversation because if you're Oprah Winfrey or George Clooney or whoever was there, why would you care about any of those things we just saw those people in those videos talking about? It, it's so removed from your life. You're living a complete, in a completely different world in a completely different universe. So while Oprah Winfrey is well-liked or Taylor Swift or whatever, these people have no connection to the people who take seriously who they're voting for based on what's best for their family, and they just don't realize that. And so here's the kind of discourse that happened, because this is the sort of thing that you, you think about if you're Oprah Winfrey. What is on your heart to say to the American people as we have 47 days um, until November 5th? What's on your heart? We to say to particularly those people who are still... Uh, undecided, or maybe indifferent, or on the fence still? We love our country. I love our country. I know we all do. That's why everybody's here right now. We love our country. We, we take pride in the privilege of being American. And this is a moment where we can and must come together as Americans, understanding we have so much more in common than what separates us. Let's come together with the, the character that we are so proud of about who we are, which is we are an optimistic people. We are an optimistic people. Americans, by character, are people who have dreams and ambitions and aspirations. We believe in what is possible. We believe in what can be. And we believe in fighting for that. That's how, that's how we came into being. So just compare those specimens that MSNBC went to examine and pick at try and like study under a microscope and understand, compare what they said they were concerned about, what their interests were, what their lives were like, to what you just heard. The disconnect could not be greater. And if you were to take an analysis of media outlets, major media outlets, corporate outlets, and look at the time they've devoted to various issues, and then compare it to a chart showing what Americans say are their most important issues, you would actually see a complete inversion because the lives of liberal elites are so radically different than the lives of most Americans. And it's not even necessarily anyone's fault in that sense, but you would just, what I don't understand is how they never process that, how they never come to see that, how they never have any humility about it, how they never realize 
that the people who they constantly purport to speak on behalf of are people who almost have nothing in common with them in the way they live their life whatsoever. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.